Welcome to another episode of the Peak Potential Success Show. My name is Fong Chua. I'm an entrepreneur, business strategist, real estate investor, speaker, and also best-selling author. And every single day, I help others unlock the potentials and guide them to succeed. Today on the show, we have another amazing guest on the show. We interview some of the biggest celebrities, uh, business entrepreneurs, multimillionaires, from athletes to uh, to artists. How are they successful, their journey? Um, how did they overcome adversity, challenges, and their keys to success? And this next guest absolutely can add to that because... When I got got into a deep dive about what he does and uh, found out his journey, wow, this guy is fascinating. He's done very, very well. He is an expert in his field, and he's been in his field for many, many years. Uh, he started at the age of 13 in lawn services. He's absolutely revolutionized that whole industry. Um, from 13, he then built his company up, uh, sold that company, and then is now focused on his current company, uh, Green Pal, and he has done very, very well. He's also been able to uh, help lots of entrepreneurs out there, uh, teaching them how to grow their businesses from zero to profitability to then exit. So I'm very, very excited to have him here. He's also been featured in some of the biggest magazines out there from Time, Forbes, and Wall Street. So please welcome entrepreneur and co-founder of Green Pal, Mr. Brian Clayton. Fong, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Hey, great awesome in- for having great, you. Great intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here. I-, I can't wait to hear your story because you you have been able to build something from scratch and then come up with an idea that completely changed how that industry works. So share with us that journey. Have you always been thinking, hey, I'm going to make lawn services my future and my life? Or was there something before that? How did you get to where you are? Yeah, you know, I actually, like you mentioned, I, I started mowing grass in high school as a way to make extra cash. And I stuck with that lawn mowing business all through high school and all through college. And I, and when I graduated college, I had to make a decision. Was I going to be a lawn guy uh, for the rest of my life, like to your point, or 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 was I going to do something else? And so I, I started thinking about it. I didn't really want to be a lawn guy. I, I That's not what I went to business school with, but, but I, I saw... I saw an opportunity. I saw I saw it as it could be my lane that I could build a big business in the landscaping industry, uh, mainly because uh, I would go to conferences and I would see I would go to like bigger cities. Uh, I, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and I grew I would go to bigger cities and I would see these big landscaping businesses with like hundreds of employees doing eight figures, uh, you know, and and beyond. And I thought, well, maybe that could be me, me one day. Maybe I could build a big business in this industry. So I I made a little business plan and. Over a 15 year period of time, little by little, worked the plan. And, and over, you know, a little over a decade, I reached eight figures in revenue. And then by year 15, I was able to get the business acquired. So that taught me a lot about how to build and scale a business, which kind of set me up for my second business, Green Pal. Mm, that is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's hard for you to go, I don't want to be a lawn guy. However, you've been the lawn guy for the whole, like the, my whole years life. <laughs> Everybody already knows you as that. Now, that very first lawn that you cut, was that something that you got forced into? Uh, you go, you know what? I don't have any other choice, but I'm going to mow your lawn. Or did you always think about, hey, I want to be into entrepreneurship. I don't want to clean houses. I don't want to do, I don't want to walk dogs. You know what? I'll do this. Yeah. You know, it, I'd like to tell you that I was just a born entrepreneur. I was just born to, to know that I wanted to work for myself. But the reality is I wasn't. I, I think my dad got tired of watching me play uh, Super Mario Kart all day, <laughs> and, and and he said, "Hey, get off your butt." Uh, I talked to the neighbors, and they need somebody to mow their their yard. And you know what? You're gonna do it. <laughs> and and uh, th- I wasn't living in a democratic household. This was a, a direct order. And and he met, he walked over next door with me and showed me how to do it, and actually mowed it with me. And and I got paid twenty bucks for like a forty five minutes of work. And in nineteen ninety three or four, that was a lot of money. <laughs> and, and so it was, so, so after I got that kind of nudge and push in the right direction, it did click with me. I thought, this is awesome. I, I just made like more in 45 minutes than I would make in a week with my allowance. And, and I can get more of these, I can go find more of these people that need this service and I could do this. And so I remember the first thing I did was I, I made some flyers on my old school desktop computer and started passing them around uh, the neighborhood and, and I got 10 or 20 customers that first summer and I just uh, it just clicked with me I, and I and I and I almost looked at it like uh, like a video game you know uh, <laughs> like like I was working levels of this game 
and and almost like a monopoly board where I could pick up customers all over the neighborhood that was clo- that were close to the other ones. And I, I looked at it like it was a game and it was a fun game. It was hard work and it sucked a lot, but but it was a game at times. And and that kind of carried me through all the way until that moment uh, when and when I had to make the decision after graduating college, was I going to make this my life's work? And it was that time that I, I came to understand that you know, you're not going to, it's going to be hard to build a business, something that you're passionate about, that you love, you know, you, the, you got to be passionate about winning. You got to be passionate about success, passionate about building something bigger than you. And it really almost doesn't matter what the industry is. In fact, uh, what 22 years have taught me is that the least glamorous your idea, your business, the least sexy it is, probably the greater your chances of success mm-hmm. Because a lot of people aren't chasing that. A lot of people aren't trying to innovate in that. So so I'm glad I stuck with something that was not glamorous and humble like landscaping maintenance because because it enabled me to build a an eight-figure business in it the first time, sell that. And then now I'm, I'm CEO of GreenPow, which is like the Uber for lawn care, uh, where you can just push a button and order a lawn mowing service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I'm going to jump into that soon. Uh, but a little bit back on, on the back history again at what point did you go, you know what, I need to expand. Like I can't do all these lawns myself. And then you go, you know what, I'm going to get my friend. I'm going to start hiring people. When was that kind of clicking in saying, you know what, I have more customers than I can actually deal with. Yeah. It it came pretty quick, actually. Uh, As it turns out, uh, there's no shortage of people wanting these services done. There's actually a shortage of people that will reliably do them and do them on time and at a fair price and and reliably well and and so it was actually probably you know 18 19 years old uh year two or three or four that that i was overwhelmed with too much work wow. and now i had to figure out okay how am i gonna get my friends to help me do this and and it quickly learned the dynamics of of <laughs> unit economics which is which is this is what it costs you to pay your buddy uh, to, to help you. And this is what you can sell his labor for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it's easy to screw that up because a lot of times you get all this work and you're excited about all of this, this workload. And then you want to throw bodies at the problem and you just want to like hire all your buddies. And, (laughs) and, and, you know, you think, okay, well, I'm going to show up with five or six of my buddies. We're going to knock this out. And then at the end of the day, you start like doing some quick back of the envelope math. You lost money on the job. You, you (laughs) actually worked for free that day and and you would have been better off staying at home. Uh-huh. And and so and so you start making these mistakes uh early on, at least that's the way I experienced it. And 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 started realizing, wow, this is this is an okay business when you're by yourself. But when you start uh adding uh unit economics to it where where you start adding labor hours and all of the costs that go along with that, it actually can can get to a break even proposition or a losing money proposition real quick. And so then uh, you have to start thinking about ways to track that and ways to, to add in little systems to know and, and, and in ways to funnel those, that feedback back into how you're pricing uh, new clientele and, and how, you're, how you're charging your existing clientele. And, and that's, what, that's maybe level two or three of the game. You know? uh, uh, and it's okay to stay on level one, stay a, a one-man band or, or just you and a helper. But once you start getting into four, five, six, ten employees, it very much becomes a, a spreadsheet game. And, and that's what hangs up a lot of founders is, is, uh, is not, is not holding themselves accountable to, to sound unit economics. How many of those buddies of yours were uh, the same buddies that go, come on, let's, let's go hang out. Let's go have a drink uh, during this whole time. And then all, all of a sudden they're like, Hey, uh, I hear you got some work for us. <laughs> all the time, man. It was, it was funny, uh, you know, trying to like string together the, the bad news bears of landscaping, it, 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 you know, this ragtag team of, guys that were hung over from drinking the night before or <laughs> that wanted to cut out early to, to go do something else or the first minute of a little bit of rain and they are gone and it's like you're out <laughs> there again by yourself so you 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 learn real quick that that the labor piece of it um and getting the reliable labor and systemizing that training people and and de- and deploying that labor is the hardest part of of a service based job like or service based business like that Right. Now, that first company of yours, you built that up to, you said, eight, eight figures and eventually you sold that. Uh, one of the biggest transactions with regards to uh, landscaping industry in history. Now, when what separated your company from your competition? Why was yours the go-to one? A couple, couple things. Um, 
there were uh so the, the first thing is 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 how did i get to eight figures how did i how did i grow it from seven to eight figures a lot of uh, it's, it's not easy to grow a landscaping business to seven figures but you can do it just through sheer hard work and determination and willing it and, and into existence and like being like uh, an animal really uh if, if you're all over the place and you're calling customers back and you're fixing what your employees screwed up and you're answering a hundred phone calls a day, you can get the business to a million dollars, but how do you get it to $10 million? Well, that, that takes systems, processes, replication, duplication. It really takes a sales engine at the core of the business. And so it took me five years to, to kind of figure that out through trial and error, how to, how to build a sales process and how to outsell my competition and how to train salespeople to, to work, to work my sales method. And so that took a long time, and that's what enabled enabled it to get uh, get to eight figures. Now, now that's all fine and good, uh, but how do you get it sold? And and so there there you know that's kind of another thing. It, 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 nobody wants to buy uh, a business that they're that's going to be a headache to run. They almost want to buy like a smooth, well running, well oiled machine that you, the owner, can step away from. And a lot of people that want to sell their business kind of want to sell it because it's a headache or they're tired of running it or, or it's just a bunch of problems. And the, and, and the reality is nobody's going to buy all your problems. And I had to learn that the hard way. And so from the moment I, I made the decision to sell the business that actually got, got it sold, it was like two years of work of, of building systems and processes and hiring the right people and fixing a lot of like deferred things that I had done wrong mm-hmm. uh, up until that point. And, and uh, the third thing that enabled me to get it sold was the balance sheet. I ran the business debt free, uh, and and this isn't really popular uh, in 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 today's business uh, climate. And but the reality was was I didn't want to take on a bunch of debt to 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 run the business because that scared me. I'd, I I the first five years of of mowing yards, I listened to talk radio all day, and sandwiched between two talk radio shows that I liked was Dave Ramsey, and so all day long four hours a day. I'm, I'm, I'm hooked up on the Dave Ramsey Kool-Aid and like, he's just like debt, debt free, no debt. Don't take on debt. Don't borrow money. And so like, I got a little wacko with it and I didn't borrow any money to run this business. So at, at, at the peak, I had like 90 trucks and, and all of those trucks were paid for. I had probably 500 pieces of, uh, of lawn mowing equipment. Um, and like a commercial lawn mower is 20 grand and all of those were paid for cash. And, and so I, I say all that to say, when I wanted to sell the business, it was debt free. And that is what enabled me to sell the business because there was three or four other landscaping businesses in the Nashville market that were doing just as much sales as me. A couple maybe that were doing more and maybe they wanted to sell the, sell a, their business for $5 million, but they also had $5 million in debt. Yeah. So they didn't have a business. They had a big chain around their neck. And, 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 and they were stuck in the business. They couldn't sell it. And, and that's a really, really scary thing. And so I, I encourage people that, that are in asset heavy businesses like that to try to try to go it a debt free, not take on leases, not take on financing, because when you want to sell it one day, if you've got a clean zero debt balance sheet, it'll be a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Now, when it came to selling that, uh, that company, was that something you've always thought about doing? Cause you, you got into it to eventually sell or you, you went, you know what, this, it's time for me to move on to something else. Like, was it difficult for you to make that decision? Well, so yeah, ideally when you uh, reach a point where you want to sell your business, you've been working a, a five-year exit strategy where it's like, okay, I'm running this business. I'm grooming it uh, for acquisition. And that's part of the strategy because how you run a business that you're going to sell versus how you're going to run a business that you're going to keep for a long time are very, very different. The The decisions you make in terms of what to expense, what expenses to defer, uh, employee composition, uh, compensation, um, how you how you go about pricing and winning market share is very very different uh, for for how you're going to run like a family oriented like lifestyle business versus one that you intend to to get acquired and and I didn't know that and so there was all these mistakes that I made running this business as like a a lifestyle business versus like teeing it up to where a company with thousands of employees could fold it in. And, and I, from, like I mentioned earlier, from the time I made the decision to sell the company to the time I was able to get it acquired was, was two years of, of just excruciating, like undoing of a bunch of stuff. And, and then also my, my outcome while good was not as good as it could have been 
because there was a lot of uh there was a lot of expenses that that I just took with running the business that I could have deferred or or not taken. And, and, you know, when you're selling a service-based company like that, it's basically net profit times like a multiple five, six, seven, eight. And so let's say you could avoid a $10,000 expense, uh, by just not doing it this year. Well, that's going to cost you, you know, that's going to make you 60 or 70 or $80,000 more at sale. Like you can just take the, the net profit and just times it by five or six or seven. And I didn't know that, like it's, it's as simple as that is, I, nobody told me that. And so there was all these like weird things. Um, so no, I didn't like work a five year, uh, plan to, to, to exit the business should have, I didn't, anybody listening to this, that's ever dreaming about selling their business, do that, be proactive about it. There's a book called built to sell. That's really good. That talks about this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so no, it was, it was very much like I had reached a point of diminishing returns in terms of like my evolution, my growth my my fulfillment by the business and so that's what prompted me to want to sell it and then it was two years of more work on top of that <laughs> now was there anybody at that time that went you got a great thing going why why sell it why give it all away yeah a lot of people uh my friends family um i remember i remember a, a family friend uh he was just like because because i was living a very comfortable life i i I had a nice house and nice cars and boats and, um, you know, I, I had a very good, nice lifestyle, but I was miserable. Uh, I just wasn't fulfilled by the business anymore. And I didn't know this, but if you're, if you're running a business properly, every two or three years, you should evolve into a whole new person. Mm -hmm. You're getting skills that you didn't have. You you're getting, uh, you're leveling up in ways you're not even realizing. You're you're reading books that you never would have read in a million years, and and so long as the business is growing and challenging you in that way, you're evolving, and and uh, that was fulfilling to me. Now I didn't know it was happening at the time, but when that plateaued, then that put me in a state of like just total misery uh, running the business, and so and so if nobody could understand that if they're not going through it, and and so and so people would be like, what the hell are you doing, you? You've, you've worked your, your butt off building this company and now you're going to sell it. But I really needed to create the space for the next thing. I, I knew that I wanted to level up to the next thing. I was, I, I wanted to, I really wanted to build a tech company and I wanted to build something with hundreds of thousands of users or millions of customers and not thousands. And, mm -hmm. and so I knew I needed to create the space to do that. So I knew it was time to sell it and move on to the next thing. Well, wow. and then your next thing you achieved that because like you, uh, you have what over two hundred thousand users as as of this moment in a very very short period of time, um, but it's also in the same industry. So yeah. you you left that industry and then you created something that would actually be a competitor to that industry. So how did you decide to stay in the uh, lawn services area? Yeah, you know, for me it was. I was looking for an idea of, of something to start a, a tech business because I wanted, I wanted to, to dip my toe into that world. I, you know, I spent 15 years of building a blue collar business and I thought, you know, what would it be like to run a tech company? That looks like fun. And mm -hmm. it looks to be, <laughs> here's what I really thought. I said, it looks to be easier. It looks to be like, like it could be easier than, than, a tech, than, than, my, than my last company. And so I thought, well, I thought somebody is going to build an app that works like Uber. Cause at the time Uber was just getting started. And, and I thought somebody's going to build an app that looks like Uber, but for home services, for lawn care, uh, home cleaning, you name it. And I thought, why, why can't that be me? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I didn't know it at the time, but like authenticity can be a big competitive advantage right. and it can really uh, be the thing that helps you, you know, get through level one or two of the game is knowing an industry that you're trying to innovate in. And so I, I spent 15 years in it. I knew it and I thought, okay, well, somebody's going to build it. Why can't that be me? And I recruited two co-founders and we, 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 we literally didn't have, have the first idea on how to build a tech product. We had never coded anything. Um, and so we, we thought, well, we'll just outsource, uh, all the tech to a dev shop and we'll just market it. And we'll be off and going. And that was like a total failure. We, we wasted like $150,000 of our own money <laughs> doing that. Uh, but we learned that we learned that at least people wanted to, to use an app like that because some people, some people were trying it and it was like a gut check moment. Cause we had to, had to realize, okay, if we're going to be in the tech business, we're going to have to learn how to code. We're going to have to learn how to build software. We're going to have to learn how to, how to build a technology product. So, 
we had to like go back to the drawing board and and just like go to YouTube University, took every online class we could and le literally learned how to build software and like rebuilt the whole thing. And that and then little by little uh, went from 50 customers to 100 and then from 100 to 1,000. And, and now we have 300,000 people using Ooh. the app nationwide in the United States to get lawn mowing services. That is absolutely incredible. And I love that that segment where you talked about, hey, why can't it be me? Because I know a lot of people like I, I've actually heard this idea before from other people saying, hey, you know what's going to make lots of money? This. But they've yeah. never done anything about it. And what you've done was you actually taken that idea and made it happen. And plus, the other thing you talked about was, well, if it's working in this area, why can't it be implemented into this area? Which is a lot of what lots of things lots of people do to really explode that industry is taking something that works somewhere else into their industry, which is exactly what you've done. Now, when it comes to uh, GreenPal, how have you how have you really grown it? Because like it's not easy going from like you said like five, ten up to now three hundred thousand plus. Uh, what was that strategy? How did you go from one in one one market to the next to the market next and then now nationwide? Yeah, that's a great question because there's a saying that first time founders worry about product, second time founders worry about distribution, and and I was really even though I had built and sold a, an eight figure landscaping business, I was really kind of a first time founder all over again starting this company because I never started a tech company and and I didn't know it at the time but like a tech business is 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 really a whole nother ball game than than a traditional blue collar business and and also um inventing a new product from scratch is a whole new thing like you can go and start a, a construction company you can start a, a a fix and flip company you can start a dry a laundry mat like these are hard businesses and you're going to have to like roll up your sleeves and be an animal to get that business off the ground. It is a hundred times harder to invent a whole new product from scratch that does not exist. Nobody knows about, nobody knows how to use it. Nobody even knows that to use it uh, and get people to use it is, is, is than a traditional business. And I didn't know any of that. And so like that was all uh, shocking to me and, and I had to kind of grind my way through that. And then, and then, so after we built the, 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 the version, the second version of the app ourselves, learn how to code, I thought, whoo, that was really hard. And then I was confronted with the reality of like, no, it's going to be 10 times harder to get, to get people to use this damn thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so getting people to use the app uh, and getting them to discover it, getting them to get, uh, having the app be where it needs to be when they're looking for a lawn mowing service uh, was, was something that took us two or three years to figure out mm -hmm. for us. We bet the whole company on organic SEO. So uh, you know, if you are in Lincoln, Nebraska, and you need a lawn mowing service in Lincoln, Nebraska, we pop up as like one, two, or three. If you are in Seattle, Washington, same thing. If you're in, in, in Buffalo, New York, same thing. And so we have built every one of these cities from the ground up, recruiting the first initial set of lawn care services to use the app, and then and then trying to get homeowners to use the app, and then, and then creating this kind of critical mass of buyers and sellers in every city. Uh, and it took a long time, it took a decade. Uh, Green Pal's a, a 10 year overnight success. <laughs> 10 year overnight success, which That's is what right. all overnight successes are take, right? About 10 years. <laughs> um, explain to us more about the uh, the app and why lots of people should use this app because uh, I'm sure there's some people here who's listening to this and hey, I've never heard about this. Uh, why should I look into this? Why should I use these services? Yeah, ordinarily, when you need a, a chore done like lawn mowing, um, you have to like go through this very old school process to get them. So you would have to ask friends and family uh, or for recommendations, or maybe you go online and go to Angie's list or Craigslist or Facebook. There's no shortage of places to go get names and phone numbers for people that cut grass. But then you have to like manually poll these people. You have to call them and say, Hey, you know, I need a grass cutting over here on, on main street Thursday. Yeah. I'll come by and look at it. And, and then they never do. And then, and then maybe they do and they give you a price and then they don't show up to mow it. And, and, and it's like this headache over and over and over again. And so with Green Pal, you literally, you just pop your address in, you'll get four or five quotes. You hire the best one that you want to work with. They come out, they do it on the day they're supposed to, and then you pay them right through the app. If that goes well, you just set it up for the whole schedule and it just happens like magic. Mm -hmm. And so that's for the consumer. For the vendor, for the pro, 
it's an entire operating system for them to run their business. They, they, they get all the new properties they want. They get paid within 24 hours, which is a big, big part of running a lawn mowing business is that cash flow. And then one place to schedule everything, one place to organize all their routes. So it's kind of like a business in the box for them. And we had to solve for that uh, to get them on board to really have a product that consumers could kind of order a lawn mowing service off the shelf, like ordering something on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Well, will we be seeing this uh, this app activated in, in Canada, other countries? In Soon. The- these, the, these invisible lines between us are very real for some reason. I don't understand why it's so much, you, you know, like, like we're in Seattle, you know, and, and to literally go across that invisible line to Vancouver <laughs> is, is like a one year project. So it's so crazy, but yes, soon we will be. Now in current day, you're also very sought after as a, a speaker an expert when it comes to building businesses, uh, building po- businesses to, to be profitable and then to, to exit. Did you ever think about at, at a period of time that you'll eventually become this this platform speaker, a speaker to show show your expertise. No, I never did. And and I didn't certainly when I when I started this business. But something uh something clicked, I guess, about eight year eight or nine. I started realizing something about myself that if I put myself in a position to share my thoughts, philosophies on on business building, on on digital marketing, on uh, entrepreneurship and, and everything that goes into that, that I get better, that I level up, that I get sharper, that, that it keeps me tuned up. And so I started doing podcasts and, and, uh, that was fun. It got to be like a hobby for me. And, and then I started realizing, man, you know, like this is causing me to like, want to go listen to this other podcast, or it's causing me to read this book I would never read or something like that. And so that for me, was a fulfilling thing. And then that, that, that like opened me, opened my eyes to, to like giving talks, to going to conferences, to, to, to doing little uh, meetups and stuff like that. And so for me, all of that kind of personal brand stuff is a hobby. I enjoy doing it. Um, and it's kind of like a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. You know, uh, I get a lot of people that say, Hey, you know, I listened to your podcast on such and such. And so I checked out green pal. And so it's good PR for the business. Uh, but 99% of the reason I do it is because I enjoy it. It's fun. It keeps me sharp. Now, at uh, all these different stages of your life and of your career, uh, can you share with us your biggest lesson uh, from mowing lawns? Okay, at the very first stage, what was the one thing that most people don't realize about their lawns that you know inside and out that it goes, you know what? This is what I learned about lawnmower. <laughs> uh, what most people don't know about their lawns. Okay, so... I'll tell you this, and this goes for anybody that you're getting to serve, do a service for you. What most people don't know is that when somebody comes and mows your yard and it takes them 15 minutes and you paid them 50 bucks, you're thinking that you're like, I just paid them $50 for 15 minutes of work. But what you don't realize is, is that guy or gal is having to get up at like four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning to sharpen the lawn mowing blades, change the oil, scrape the deck. They probably, their knuckles are probably bleeding from where they banged them on the, on the side of the lawnmower deck, getting the, 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 the blade off. Um, their back hurts because they've, they already worked for three or four hours before they, they did their first property that day. So my, my point is like, is like if you're servicing, if you're paying somebody for a service, whether it's a maid, anything, there's like all of this other work that you don't see that goes into uh, delivering that service to you. So just so so that's a little bit of like behind the scenes, behind the curtain perspective. I'll give folks. I can I can I can kind of see you at that age putting oh, yeah. a spreadsheet and go, wait a minute, I'm up at five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, biggest lesson you had when you were uh, building your first business. Uh, the f- biggest lesson I had, uh, m- there was hundreds, but one that really stands out was when I realized I wasn't in the grass cutting ser- business. I wasn't in the landscaping business. I was really in the sales business. Um, and that was probably year five. And, and, uh, and that distinction, um, really, really helps you clarify how you think. Um, cause, cause if you're in the landscaping business, you get, ticked off because customers fire you for somebody cheaper or you lose biz- or you don't win business because you you because of x y and z and that you and and it's like 
you have this really like distorted perception of reality. And, it, and it's like, no, you're not in the landscaping business. You're in the sales business. And part of being in the sales business is trying to figure out what your value proposition is. And, and so if I'm your, I, so value proposition is if I'm your ideal prospect, why would I do business with you versus anybody else? And the answer to that question has to be compelling. It can't be, oh, because my employees wear uniforms and we wash our trucks and uh, we give free estimates. Like these are not reasons for a value proposition. It has to be compelling. It has to be a reason why I'm going to do business with you versus anyone else. And so once you can like hammer out that value proposition and then build a sales process around it, it really opens your eyes into what business you're really in. And, and a lot of times you're in like, you're solving problems that you didn't even know you were solving. Like, like we, w we eventually built that business, you know, with, to a commercial client base and we would sell apartment complexes on, on hundred thousand dollar landscaping packages because we would show them that an increase in curb appeal equated to an increase of occupancy. And so we were really in the business of selling occupancy. Mm -hmm. We weren't selling grass cutting. We were selling increased rents. We weren't selling landscape maintenance. And so once I realized that I didn't look at it different, look at it the same. And, and it kind of like opened up a whole new way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. uh, biggest life lesson when it comes to selling that property, that, that, uh, that company. Um, a lot of lessons. Uh, one is, you know, hope is not a strategy. Um, a lot of times you hope things will go away and hope things will fix themselves. And, one of the eye-opening things that that I realized when when I was getting that business groomed for sale was all of the accumulated like debt in terms of like people I had kept around that really weren't good cultural fits, um, equipment that was worn out that that I need I should have replaced, customers that weren't good fits for the business that I should have jettisoned, um, personal things that I should have worked on, leadership skills. Uh, that, that, that were all of this debt and all of these things, because you kind of hope, hope these things go away. And, and the moment you see them stick their head up, you gotta, you gotta deal with them. Then whether it's somebody that you hired, who's not a good fit or a customer that you took on that you underpriced or something. And so it what was eye opening was like, it was 15, it was 13 years of accumulated debt and all of these things <laughs> that I had to address. It sucked. It was eye opening. Um, <laughs> The uh, the biggest lesson when it comes to your tech company and building up uh, Greenpool. Yeah, uh, the beauty of build once, sell twice. And so a lot, a lot of times a technology business is that. You spend a lot of time building the infrastructure, building the user experience, building all of the things that, that people use and get value from. And, and you can build that one time. And sure, it's a lot of work to maintain it and fix it and improve it. It never ends. But, uh, but it really is you can build once and sell twice or build once and sell 100 times. Mm -hmm. so and, as you're, sorry, continue. And, and so as, as I was uh, building the company, it took 10 years, but as I was building it, and my team and, you know, I was hiring developers and hiring engineers. And I started seeing like all of these ways I was, I left money on the table in my first company, uh, not, in, not implementing systems, uh, not implementing processes, not implementing technology off the shelf. I mean, we would, we would, uh, we would beat our heads against the wall, like training an employee, like on how to do certain things. And like somebody would go through the same process manually training them. And nowadays you can do this with, you can build once, build the best training system and have them go through that training system. Sure. It might take you 20 or 30 hours to build that system, but you can build it once. And then, and then, and then you can run a hundred employees through that. And, and so building green Pile, I was exposed to a different way of thinking of building once selling twice. And so every founder of any kind of business should try to think like a tech entrepreneur. It, it can really help them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And as you're uh, doing more and more speaking, is there anything that you realize that, hmm, this is a big eye opener in the speaking area? Really and truly authenticity is, is a competitive advantage. You, you have to, for me, I don't talk about anything that I haven't personally done, lived and, and, uh, experienced. And so for, and, and I think a lot of times, especially today, we, we get into this, 
this world of of uh of people who who may or may not necessarily have have like been through the fire on cer- on certain things and 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 trying to sell you a course on how to do it um there's a saying by uh Mark Cuban and he says never take advice from somebody who isn't doing what it is that you want to do or hasn't already done it and and I think when it comes to like doing your own speaking doing your own podcast like like uh stay congruent to what your experiences are and even if you've only built a million dollar business there's people out there who are sitting in a cubicle who haven't done that and they want to do that and they want to hear your story on how you did that and and the beauty about like mentorship today is that you can get like mentored you know asynchronously from people who are like just one level ahead of the game than you are and mm-hmm. and um, right now, you know, Green Pal's at $30 million a year in revenue, and I'm trying to learn from people who are at 100. I, I listened to a talk from Brian Chesky, the CEO and founder of Airbnb the other day, and it was inspiring. It was great. But Brian Chesky might as well be on Mars <laughs> compared to where I'm at. And so it's like I need to listen to a talk from the guy or gal that who's at $100 because that's where I'm trying to get to. Mm. So so that's that's my advice on that is is it doesn't matter, like, what your journey is, just stay congruent to that. Talk authentically about that, and 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 how you're getting to to the to the next level. And people can learn from that. Mm-hmm. No, there's a lot of people out there who are so so uh, fixed in their ways. They want to be doing everything on their own. Uh, they want to do everything uh, according to what they know. For you, you've been able to level up consistently throughout your entire career. Uh, you surround yourself with great people. You've also learned from lots of different people as well. What do you tell people who are trying to go at it themselves, uh, where they're too stubborn to go? Let me let me open up to listen to advice. Yeah, it's <laughs> it, it's going to be really hard because you don't know what you don't know. And I've been I've been stuck in these traps before where where I didn't really know. Like you ever notice, like people who live in small towns or and aren't exposed to new ideas and stuff or like some of the most like know-it-all people. It's like, because knowledge is this weird thing. It's like the more, the more you learn and are exposed to new ideas, it's like the circle gets bigger. And then the edge of the circle is your exposure to new things. And then like you get this humility because you realize, I don't know anything. And it's like, it's this weird thing. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't learn, the more you realize you don't know. And so you can get stuck in these little kind of local maximums of knowledge and if you don't expose yourself to people who are at the next level of the game then you can get stuck in in the level you're at and and not even know know that you're stuck one or know how to get out of it um the good news is these days you can (laughs) with a few keystrokes on youtube get get the exposure you need uh from from somebody who's at the who's who's is pract- who's a practitioner of the next level who's giving a talk at a conference who's doing a youtube or who's doing a, a podcast interview and the funniest thing is some of the most valuable stuff that i've consumed on youtube is is like the least viewed i <laughs> i uh i listened to a talk the other day about from this dude who uh was one of the first growth marketers at uber back in like 2013 and he's giving this talk about how the uh, venture capitalists you know they, they raised the big round of funding and how he was personally responsible for deploying a billion dollars of capital to buy market share and so how do you do that so he's talking about how he did testing of the referral program testing of facebook ads testing of Twi- twitter ads all of these different channels and he's literally talking about the nuts and bolts of how he deployed a billion dollars of capital and it was so impressive and I'm learning a little bit from what he's talking about. And then I look down. This this video is like is like a year and a half old, and it's got 14 views. And so I think a lot of times when you are like seeking out mentorship, start with that. Start with like the rabbit hole of the people who who are doing the things that that you want to do, and like seek out and consume everything they put out. Then maybe like hit them up for some real mentorship, or maybe they're doing some coaching, or maybe they got a program or something like that. But but you can start asynchronously. You can start where you're consuming what somebody else is putting out and get mentorship that way for free before you you know dive off the deep end of 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 trying to do it officially. 
Awesome. Uh, now, for for people who are looking for for help, for advice about growing their businesses, um, do you have a, a quick kind of five step kind of uh, recommendation as to what they should focus on or think about? Yeah, you know, um, if if somebody is is so so first off, here's the thing: you're gonna when you're starting a business, you're gonna be doing three things at once. You're you're gonna be working in the business. And, and so from, you know, answering phone calls, fulfilling orders, making sure the trains run on time uh, and just making sure the damn business is held together, making sure that the lights stay on. Then you're going to be working on the business. And everybody says that they know that. But few people take the time to work on the business. What is the business's biggest problem right now? Well, the phone isn't ringing. So you got to You got to start working on a marketing strategy or I can't keep people. You hear that all the time. You got to start working on an employee training strategy and an employee training system or employee recruitment system. You got to work on the business. And then the third thing is nobody talks about is you got to work on yourself. You are going to have to level up. You're going to have to read books. You're going to have to go to YouTube University. You're going to have to attend some conferences. You're going to have to get some coaching. You're going to have to make the time to work on yourself. So maybe it's like a a three-step process. Work in the business, and maybe that's Monday through Friday. Work on the business. Maybe that's Saturday. And then work on yourself. Maybe that's Sunday, and and then I'll and then I'll add a fourth thing. Uh, like become an animal. Like is somebody, like the first five years of you starting your business, like your friends, your family should describe you as an animal. And I don't mean like, oh, he kind of has this weird long neck. He looks like a giraffe. No, I mean like, like this dude is an absolute animal. All he cares about is getting that business going because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take that type of mindset to, to to do these three things in the business on the business and on yourself well wow, that's a very good advice there when it comes to you uh you've grown you've you've scaled what's the next big thing are we going to see uh different tech being applied to different industries are we going to see more more expansion from you what what's the next big thing you know, for me, uh, I made a decision when I sold this company, when I sold my last company, that I was going to just work on my best idea. And fortunately, I've had one good idea in 10 years. And, and that's it. You should push a button and somebody should come mow your yard. <laughs> and, and I was going to work on that as, as long as I was having fun. And so for me, this business has always given me that fulfillment. It's always been that challenge for me. And, and I've enjoyed it. And I guess a third caveat to that is so long as I'm good at it and I'm, and I'm still decent at it. Um, we may find that once we get to like a hundred million in sales and a, and a million users, I suck. And, and so, and at, at that point, you know, we'll bring in a professional CEO or something, but, but so for me, it's real simple. I'm just working on my best idea and having fun doing it. And for us, you know, that's, that's more of what we're good at. We're we're the easiest way in in, the, in anywhere in the United States. If you need a grass cutting service, is the easiest way in the world to do it. You just mm-hmm. download the app. Somebody comes and does it. But we're still very much a drop in the bucket. Uh, it's a ninety nine billion dollar industry. You wouldn't think it, but it, it's a huge industry. So we got a lot of white space in this one thing that we're already focused on, and we're just going to keep doing more of that. That is absolutely awesome. Um, what's the Let's put you on the world stage and you get a couple of minutes to share one of the most insightful messages that you want everybody to remember Brian for. What would that be? Uh, I hope anybody that knows me that listened to a interview with me or something just says, you know what? One thing about that guy, if he could do it, he made me feel like I could do it. And, and uh, there's nothing special about me there, and, and there's nothing extraordinary about me. I, and I started off as with a push mower and, and uh, got to where I am today just through little incremental progress. Um, and so that's that's what I hope people would remember me for is that is that the dude w- made you feel like you could get in the game and 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 do something great because because that's that's the message I like to try to convey. So get in the game because only when you're in the game can you win. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for that. Great words to live by. Now before I let you go, I got five rapid fire questions for you. First thing that comes to mind. All right. All right. Uh, you're stranded on a deserted island. One food to eat for the rest of your life, no consequence. Oh, man. I would, uh, first off, I'd love to have the superpower to eat whatever I wanted and not get fat. So, <laughs> so, 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 uh, but the one food, 
pizza, man. I, I, I just got, I, I was in Italy not too long ago and I had some of the best damn pizza. I could eat pizza all day. I can't anymore because it's just like, it's just my body just puts on a big belly, but, but, uh, <laughs> but pizza. Oh, yeah. It's all good. Um, Hollywood calls and go, Hey, Brian, we'd love to do a biopic on you on your story. Who would you cast to play you? Oof. If Hollywood called me, I would get canceled in about 10 minutes. So that's that's not a reality. But who I would love to to play me, uh Jonah Hill is not as fat as he was, so I would I would pick him. <laughs> Jonah Hill shows up at your door and go, Hey Brian, I got casted. Let's hang out. What does your amazing night with him look like? What do you take him out to? What what food do you make him? What what does that like night look like? Oh man. Well, let's just say, um, if, if it, it, let's just say it could happen. I love to travel so I could be anywhere in the world, but let's just say I'm in my hometown of Nashville. Uh, I imagine he's never done a proper Nashville night out. Uh, I, I doubt he has. And so a, a proper Nashville night out is a night out on Broadway where you go from one bar to the next and you listen to live music and whether you're a country music fan or not, I'm not a big country music fan. Um, that's what we would do because that is an experience that everybody should, should have before they die. It's, it's no, no city in the world like Nashville. And, uh, you could be in one of these little dives and, and like, you know, Keith Urban just come, uh, come up and start playing. So like, oh. that's what I would, that's what I would do. And then he would get a sense for me and who I am. How can you not be a country music fan? You're, you're <laughs> immersed in that environment. 24 <laughs> 7 man you grow up around it it starts to all sound the same and it hadn't changed in 30 years so <laughs> uh, is there a hidden talent that not many people know about a hidden talent of mine um is i first off i'm like the laziest hardest working person you'll ever meet so i'm lazy man like i can i i don't want to get get up and go to the gym i don't want to stare at spreadsheets i don't want to do a lot of these things that it takes to get from one level to the next uh so something that i do a lot of people don't know about is i will like have these moments of of ambition and in those moments i will uh i will like sabotage myself for the next week or two so i'll, I'll make these commitments uh or i'll do certain things that i, I call i call them trip wires so they're like they're things that i lay out in my path that i literally have to have to trip over so one example of this would be just something as simple as hiring a boxing coach. I don't like to spar. I don't like getting smacked around. I don't like all the cardio that goes with it, but I'll hire a boxing coach. So every Thursday I got to like go, go be, get beat up by this guy. Or <laughs> I hate, I hate staring at spreadsheets, not a data guy, not a quantitative dude. But you know, when you get to a certain point in business, you got to manage by the numbers or else you're going to wake up in a, in a lot of trouble. And so, and so I, I, I've got a lady that works for me who's a, who's a financial analyst that makes like thousand bucks an hour. <laughs> and like when, when, and, and I can only afford her for, you know, five hours a month. But, uh, but when I meet with her once every two weeks, I better have all my, my ducks in a row and my stuff together. So these little things that, that I do that are like accountability, whether it be to friends or to, to consultants or to, uh, to freelancers or contractors or employees or stakeholders that hold me accountable to, to stay in check and stay doing what I need to be doing. I could just imagine you on this talent show and they go, so what's your special talent? Like, Let me show you. <laughs> I don't like skydiving. Do, 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 do. Booked. I'm doing that Friday. Ex exactly. I don't like taxes. Do, 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 do. I'm <laughs> doing my taxes Friday. That's my talent. <laughs> exactly. That's my superpower. That's it. Moments of ambition. And using those to my advantage. <laughs> awesome. Um, give me a number from one to five. Uh, let's do three. One, two, three. So if you had to compare success to a kaleidoscope, how is success like a kaleidoscope? It, it, you know, it evolves and the, the, the target moves and it is always changing. You know, your idea of success at one stage of your life, like when I was 18, I thought, man, if I could just live in this neighborhood that I'm cutting grass in, then that will be success. And like, this is like the best neighborhood in town and, and, you know, all the nicest houses and nice cars and stuff. If I could just live in this neighborhood, that will be success and I will be good. And, uh, I, I was able to live in that neighborhood by like 29 and, 
and my neighbors were <laughs> they didn't like the fact that I lived there but but I did and 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 then and then after I got that I was like well this isn't what I thought it was going to be and so <laughs> then the success like the next level like became this altruist like this this internal thing this 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 thing that 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 I that I wanted like something more out of life I wanted a bigger better challenge and so like a like you look down a kaleidoscope and it's it's evolving and changing and maybe it is beautiful that that it, it's a moving target and it's cool that it is mm -hmm. awesome so that's how success is like kaleidoscope usually I end it with that but I just I'm just curious when was the last time you played Mario Kart oh man <laughs> well dude I was like all over at Nintendo uh up until the day I, I like finished college and then I made decisions like time to grow up, dude. And I threw, I literally like gave away my consoles or threw all my games away and stuff. And I haven't played a, I really haven't owned a game since then, but, uh, I, I was at somebody's house maybe five or five years ago and, and I played the new version. And so it was like some two or three consoles later. And I was like, damn, this has changed a lot. Y'all got a, y'all got a, y'all got a super Nintendo laying around anywhere. <laughs> and it's like i got my butt i got my butt whooped here i thought that i was gonna like like wax everybody no man there's a lot of new features that i, that I did not know about oh wow well, um, I, <laughs> I just watched the mario movie and oh, cool. they had a scene where they're driving mario a, a cart on rainbow road and did the they did the right turn jump off the lane onto the bottom lane like oh sweet they put that in the movie <laughs> nice <laughs> nice yeah there's a lot of parallels to the business and life super mario kart <laughs> i love it well awesome thank you very much for your time i've had a blast speaking with you and I, I learned a lot of things from you you got a lot of great value that you've added and uh just a, a pleasure having you here so thank you very much fong thanks for having me on it's been great awesome um anything else that you want to share last last words and what's the best way for people to reach out yeah, yeah. Anybody wants to hit me up, uh, just hit me up at Instagram, Brian M. Clayton. Um, anybody listening to this doesn't want to waste time mowing your own, your own yard, just go to greenpal.com. <laughs> and uh, final thoughts, you know, a lot of times when you are thinking about starting a business or you're in a business, you can think, oh, I'm too late to it. Uh, uh, you know, I missed it. You can think that like, oh, real estate's too high. And so I missed it. Or, you know, the gig economy, I missed it. Or, you can think, uh, you know, whatever it is, or 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 now with AI is the, is the new thing. Like, oh, it's too late. I'm I'm late to the game. The reality is, is it always gets bigger. It always goes up and to the right. Yeah, there's that. There's dips and there's periods where it's it's sideways, but it always gets bigger. You didn't miss it. You're not too late. Get started now, because like five years from now, you'll arrive somewhere. The only question is where. And like the business you start today can be the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that. For everybody else, make sure you connect with Brian. Uh, find out how, how they can help you with your lawn services. I'm sure they can. And they'll do a great job and also in record time as well. So uh, check uh, Green Pal out. And for everybody else, uh, he is Brian. My name is Fong Chua. Until next time, today is the day to lock your peak potential. We'll see you later. <laughs>